All right, so you wanted the breakdown on Zelensky's new victory plan, huh? Well, we've got you covered. Yeah, this is a big one, not just another peace proposal. Definitely not. We're talking a five-point plan to end the war with Russia by 2025. Ambitious, to say the least. And a lot hinges on whether the West will really get on board this time. I think what's really striking here is Zelensky's directness. He's not mincing words. He's saying, look, this is the situation. This is what needs to happen. Are you with us or not? No kidding. So let's get into it. Point one, he's calling for a straight up invitation to join NATO. No more delays, no more maybes. Bold move. It is bold. Yeah. NATO membership for Ukraine has always been a bit of a geopolitical hot potato. Russia sees it as a red line. And even within NATO, there's always been this tension, this worry about provoking Russia. Right. And we're already seeing that play out in the reactions. Yeah. Latvia is all in. But the Netherlands, root specifically, he's urging yeah, caution. Exactly. It's a very delicate balance. OK, so point two, bolstering Ukraine's defenses. We're talking more weapons. Fewer restrictions on how they can use them, even, and this is a big one, the possibility of strikes within Russian territory. Yeah, and that's where things get really interesting, because there's been a lot of military aid going to Ukraine, but actually engaging inside Russia, that's a whole different ballgame. It ups the ante considerably. And I imagine there are concerns that this could escalate things pretty drastically. Exactly. Even some of Ukraine's strongest supporters might get cold feet at that point. And you can bet the Kremlin is watching all of this very closely. Trying to exploit those divisions, no doubt. Absolutely. In fact, they're already suggesting that Europe's arms industry just isn't equipped for a long haul commitment like this. Whether that's true or not is another matter. Right. It's hard to say how much of that is bluster, how much is strategic maneuvering. But it's definitely something to keep an eye on. OK, so points one and two, we're talking about hard power, military might, alliances. Yeah. But there's an economic dimension to this plan as well, right? Absolutely. Point four is all about securing a long term economic agreement with the West. And a big part of that is attracting investment in Ukraine's natural resources. Right. And Zelensky is framing this very strategically. He's not just asking for aid. He's saying, look, investing in Ukraine is investing in democracy. It's a way to push back against Russian influence. So it's not just about winning the war. It's about securing Ukraine's future as a strong, independent player on the world stage. Exactly. And I think that message is going to resonate with a lot of Western leaders because ultimately they know that a prosperous Ukraine is in everyone's best interest. It's about stability. It's about security. It's about sending a message. Makes sense. All right. Last but definitely not least, point five. What role does Ukraine play in a post-war world? What is Zelensky's vision? And this is where it gets really fascinating, because he's proposing that Ukrainian forces, with all of their combat experience, could actually replace some U.S. troops currently stationed in Europe. Wow. OK, so he's basically saying, hey, we become the experts in fighting a modern war against Russia. We're a valuable asset and we should be treated as such. Precisely. He's putting Ukraine's military expertise front and center. And look, you can't deny they've proven themselves on the battlefield. No, absolutely. But I imagine this is a tough pill to swallow for some in the West. Oh, absolutely. Because on the one hand, there's this recognition that Ukraine has sacrificed so much, they've shown incredible strength and resilience. But on the other hand, there's still that fear of poking the bear, of provoking Russia. It's a tough balancing act. It really is a tightrope walk, isn't it? And speaking of delicate situations, we can't ignore this new development, can we? Zelensky timed his plan with a pretty serious accusation, claiming North Korea is sending troops to aid Russia. Yeah, potentially thousands of soldiers. That would definitely up the ante. To be fair, the Kremlin denies it, and so far the evidence is still kind of murky. But there have been reports from intelligence agencies, haven't there? I think one from our USI mentioned North Korea sending artillery shells and rockets to Russia. Right. There have been whispers for a while, so it's not coming out of nowhere. OK, but still, what would North Korea's involvement even mean, big picture? What are they hoping to gain from all this? Well, they're pretty isolated on the world stage right now, mostly because of the whole, you know, nuclear weapons and human rights situation. Yeah, not exactly known for being the good guys. Right. So siding with Russia, especially in this conflict, it's a way for them to break out of that isolation a little, maybe get a bit of international legitimacy, potentially some economic or military support in return. Who knows? It's a risky play. But high risk, high reward. Maybe that's how they see it. Could be. And then there's the whole nuclear wild card. Right. Because Arya also said North Korea probably has enough material to double their arsenal, right? 
Yeah, and that's not even taking into account their progress with missile technology. I mean, they've tested ICBMs that could actually hit the U.S. mainland. So this isn't just a regional issue anymore. It's a global threat. Exactly. This has the potential to blow up in a big way. Which puts even more pressure on the rest of the world to present a united front. No doubt. And you have to wonder what this means for countries like South Korea. They're stuck in a really tough spot. Because on the one hand, they obviously don't want a nuclear-armed North Korea on their doorstep. But on the other hand, they're allies with the U.S. It's a delicate balancing act, for sure. Okay, so bringing it back to Zelensky's plan. With all this uncertainty, this new threat on the horizon, is there even a chance this plan works? Will NATO actually extend that invitation? Well, historically, NATO has not been keen on offering membership to a country actively at war, especially a war as volatile as this one. Right, because of Article 5. Right, Article 5. Attack on one is an attack on all. And that could easily spiral into something much, much bigger. And they were in World War III territory. Nobody wants that. Nobody wants that. So it's a huge risk, even for NATO. So Zelensky's walking a tightrope here. He's pushing for a stronger response but is also risking making things even worse. That's the dilemma, isn't it? It's a gamble, no doubt about it. So how does this all play out? What happens if the West doesn't give Zelensky what he wants? That's the million dollar question. If the West hesitates, if they don't provide the support Zelensky's asking for, it could embolden Russia even more. And then what? And potentially their allies too, like North Korea. It's a lot to process and it feels like the stakes just got even higher. Yeah. But for the average person in Ukraine, what does all of this high-level diplomacy actually mean? What does it mean for them on the ground? That's the thing. It's so easy to get caught up in the geopolitical maneuvering that we forget about the human cost of this conflict. It's easy to get lost in the weeds, right? Right. But we're talking about real lives here. What does Zelensky's plan, all of this, yeah. actually mean for people on the ground in Ukraine? That's the thing. While these plans are being debated, Ukrainians are facing another winter. And not just any winter. We're talking about no heat, no electricity, the constant threat of attacks. It's unimaginable. So on one hand, you have this victory plan, this message of hope for the future. But can hope rebuild a country? Can hope keep you warm when it's below freezing outside? And that's the challenge, isn't it? Zelensky's talking about ending the war by 2025. But even if everything goes perfectly, even if the West is fully on board, which is a big if, it's still a long road ahead. And the involvement of North Korea just throws another wrench in the works. It's a gamble, no question. Yeah. But I do think something has shifted. Zelensky isn't just reacting anymore. He's dictating the terms. Right. He's forcing the world to take sides. Absolutely. For a long time, there was this sense that Ukraine was caught in the middle of a much bigger game. But now Zelensky's taking control of the narrative. He's saying, this is our fight. This is what we believe in. And you're either with us or against us. It's a power move. Mm -hmm. But it's not without risk. If the West doesn't back him up, it could backfire spectacularly. No question. If Russia senses any hesitation, any weakness, they're going to exploit it. And then we're talking about a whole different ballgame. So where does that leave us? What's the one thing you hope our listeners take away from all of this? I think the biggest takeaway here is that this isn't a done deal. The future is not set in stone. How this plays out, what the consequences are, it all depends on the decisions being made right now by world leaders, by everyday people. So it's not just about watching this unfold from a distance. Exactly. It's about staying informed, engaging in these conversations, holding our leaders accountable. This is a pivotal moment, not just for Ukraine, but for the entire world. And the choices we make now will have consequences for years to come. Well said. And on that note, we'll leave you with this. This isn't a spectator sport. It's time to decide where you stand.